Algebra 2, Concept 3, Linear Models. When we use the term models in math, we're talking about equations that are representing a real-life situation. Now, if you're watching this video, you're probably not going to be able to work with a partner, but I want you to try this out yourself. I want you to read each of these descriptions and see if you can match the descriptions with one of the graphs below. So this will be a um, review for, for you because you've covered these concepts, um, linear concepts in Algebra 1. So go ahead and pause the video, read through each situation and match it with the graph. Then come back um, and watch and we'll talk about these together. All right, let's look at this first situation. So we've got a person who gives $20 per week to a friend to repay a loan. So if you think about it, um, and the loan was $200. So you're looking for a graph that starts at 200 and then is decreasing. So you've got two choices of decreasing graphs, two and four. So look for one that starts at 200. And you should focus in on graph number two. Situation B, an employee receives $12.50 per hour plus $2 for each unit produced per hour. So perhaps you're looking for a graph that shows a starting amount of $12.50 and then an increase of two for each one unit produced. So you're looking for a graph that is increasing. So that would be one or three. And graph number one begins at $12.50. That's where it crosses the y-axis. Situation number three, a sales representative receives $30 per day for food, plus about 57 cents for each mile driven. So you're looking for a graph that begins around 30 and then increases. So that would be graph B. And then last one, D, is going to be graph number four. So again, you've got a computer that is worth um, 750, but it's depreciating, so it's decreasing like our first situation. So that would be graph number four. All right, now in this part of our um, concept three, our linear notes, we're going to look at situations that can be modeled using um, a linear function. Let's just review a linear function. So y equals mx plus b. Hopefully you remember that this is what we call slope-intercept form. And the reason is, is because at a glance, we can see the slope of the line, which is how the line is slanting. We can also see where the line is crossing the y-intercept or the starting point. X and Y's are used um, typically, those are what we call our variables. And then traditionally, X is our input and Y is our output. M is our slope. So a slope is a rate of change. To find a slope, one way you can do it is using two points. You can take one y value and subtract the other, so that shows you the difference in rise. And then you can take one x value and subtract the other, and that shows you the difference in run, rise over run. And in a real life situation, slope is our rate of change in the situation. And then B is our y-intercept on the graph, and in a real-life situation, it will be our starting amount. So here are some easy steps to write an equation of a line. Look at the situation, um, pick out two points, you know, x and y relationships, and then find the slope, the, ch the rate of change. Look at the y-intercept, find it. You can do that using the slope-intercept, um, equation and plugging in a point and the slope and solving for b. And then use the slope and the y-intercept values to write an equation of a line um, or the equation that would model the situation. So let's just try this. Let's write um, the equation of these lines. We're going to find the slope, the y-intercept, and write the equation. From the graph, sometimes on a graph you can just count. You can say how many up, uh, compared to how many over from one point to the next to find the slope. But you can always pick out two points and then do our slope formula. So with our formula, we're going to take one y value and subtract the other. 
and then the corresponding x value and subtract the other. So the slope of this line is negative 2 thirds. So the line is, you can think of the negative up with the numerator. It is going down and then running over 3. Now to see where it's crossing, we can't quite tell from the graph exactly where it's crossing, so we can use the equation. So we plug in x and y and our slope and solve for b. So 6 thirds minus 4 thirds is 2 thirds. That would be difficult for us to eyeball. So we now we know where it's crossing exactly. So we can write the equation that y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 2 thirds. Sometimes you won't have a graph of a line, just two points. So again, you can find the slope. So difference in y values over difference in x values. So we get negative 16 over positive 5. And it's just fine to leave slope as a fraction. We plug in a point, x and y, and the slope and solve for our b value. So our b value is 103 fifths or 20.6. And now we can use our b value and our slope, our m, to write the equation. All right, just a brief review of how to write an equation of a line in slope-intercept form. Now let's look at this situation. So the graph shows the distance y that asteroid 2012 DA4 travels in so many seconds x. Write an equation of the line and interpret the slope. We'll talk about that. Then, the asteroid came within 17,200 miles of Earth in February of 2013. How long does it take the asteroid to travel that distance? So the first thing we're going to focus on is writing an equation of a line. Just by looking at the graph, I see I have two points clearly visible, 0, 0, and 5, 24. I can find the slope. And this is going to be easy. It's just 24 fifths. But this is a real life situation. So I want to do this in terms of miles per second. So 4.8 miles per second. That's pretty fast. So my y-intercept is 0. So I know that my b value will be 0. So it's my equation can just be y equals my slope 4.8 times x. Now let's talk about that situation where the asteroid came within 17,000 miles of Earth. So to find out how fast the asteroid travels um, that distance, or could travel that distance, I plug in that distance, the miles, for our y value and solve. So it would take the asteroid about 3,600 seconds, um, about 59.7 or minutes or one hour to travel the rest of the distance on to Earth. So here's another situation. Two prom venues charge a rental fee plus a fee per student. The table shows the total cost for different numbers of students at Lakeside Inn. That's one venue possibility. The total cost Y in dollars for students at Sunview Resort, another possibility, is represented by this equation. So which venue charges less per student? So looking at what we've got, we know a lot of information for Sunview. We've got the equation. We know that x is students and y is cost, and our slope will be that rate of change, so cost per student. So at a glance, we can tell that Sunview charges $10 per student. Lakeside Inn, however, we just have tables of values. We don't know that, but we can easily figure it. You may even be just figuring it in your mind right now, but I'm going to use the formula. So I'm going to take the first two situations as my points and subtract, find my difference in y's, dividing by my difference in x's. So that shows that Lakeside Inn would charge about $12 per student. So Sunview charges less per student. Now it says, how many students must attend for the total cost to be the same? Well, it would be helpful to know the whole picture for Lakeside, so to know their starting amount. So I'm going to go ahead and find my y-intercept, my starting amount, my b-value, and write the equation. Now, to find when the cost would be the same, when you hear same in math, that means equal. So we can just set those two equations that represent those two situations equal to each other and solve. 
which you can see I'm doing this on your screen. So number of students would be 150. So if you had 150 students, um, then the cost would be the same. And then any more, one venue would be cheaper, any less, the other venue would be cheaper. Okay, that concludes the first part of your notes on linear modeling.